the cloud. All right, and we are recording. I'm so excited about our guest today. Welcome to Playing to Win. This is the last of the author series. This has been so much fun, John, because I've had uh, three different authors, and they're all people that I respect and admire that I know really well too. And so I'm super, super privileged to have you wrap up the series for us today in something we haven't really touched on at all in, in playing to win, which is dual career and, and your story is amazing. So uh, before I talk more about you, just welcome John uh, Clyde to the show this morning. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. I was Kind of like, you know, I, I see you from afar with Facebook and all the great things you're doing. And when I'm in Austin, you know, we take the visit through Southwest and all that. But um, you, you, you've done you have a, you had an awesome you have an awesome career with Keller Williams and you keep uh, laying that foundation for so many leaders. So thank you. Oh, it's, it's an honor. It's in fact, a, I don't know if you know this, but about a year ago, I moved full time to North because Keller Williams now owns the three offices, North, South, and Lake Travis. And so we're really working on this, um, you know, group effort citywide. And it's been a lot of fun. You know, we're having a lot of fun. So it's kind of the next level of leadership for me, even though I've been an OP and a team leader. When I read your book and I didn't know your whole story, I'm just, I've watched you from afar and have always admired you. And I, I know you're a great guy, but this just made me just uh, appreciate and value you even at a higher level, which is hard to believe. So I'm, I'm really excited. I, I get to introduce Thank you to you. my whole world here in Austin and around the world. You know, we have a lot of people that'll come watch these from all over that probably know you, but if they don't know you, I'm really glad they'll know you after today. So thank you for being here. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have some fun. So that since, since this is an author series, I get to go out of your book. Okay, so we're going to talk about your book. I, I've got some passages that I really like that I'd love to explore more with you and kind of get your thoughts behind it. And then I want to apply it also to real estate, right? Because you're a real estate guy. I mean, you're a real estate investor and all that, but I love to open it up with the about the author. Okay, so yeah. uh, just to introduce you to the group. So I'm going to start with that. So he, he's got his picture and everything. So it says, uh, John Clyde comes from the heart of working class America. From the time he was old enough to swing a hammer, he worked with his dad in the family roofing business, returning during the summertime and school breaks as he pursued his education. Hot roofing is a physically demanding job. Add in the fact that many of John's co-workers were convicted felons given a second chance after serving time. It's easy to see how life experience molded the young man. This was no union job with guaranteed benefits and money. This was hard labor employment. John learned about hard work and hard knocks on the sun-baked tar-topped roofs of New, New Jersey homes. Reflecting on those days, John says, the lessons were clear to me. I learned exactly what I did not want to do. Unfortunately, I learned another lesson in college that I was not going to play professional football. After two season ending, uh, after two season ending surgeries, it became clear that I must develop a great career, one that did not depend on athletic uh, prowess which is a big deal, right? Uh, yep. Today, John Clyde wears many business hats. So just so that people uh, on the call understand this, he, you're an operating principal at Keller Williams Realty, Washington Township. He opened the office in 2012 and has expanded from starting a sales team of six agents to nearly 400 agents. Wow. We're at, four, we're at 432 now. Woo! -hoo! I figured I was going to say so because, yeah. you know, it's been in print for just a little bit. Yeah. So that that's yeah. amazing. Congratulations. You. Uh, you're also regional director of the greater Pennsylvania region, which covers three states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Delaware, and consists uh, of nearly 10,000 agents in 49 market centers. 10,300. I was going to say, <laughs> I wish I had the loud like, ah, the crowd yeah. goes crazy, right? Uh, investor in five other market centers inside the region, investor who runs the Clyde Group, the home of his real estate team. And the Clyde Group began in 1999. John's award-winning real estate team has sold 3,000 plus units and achieved more than $400 million in sold sales since inception. As a real estate investor, John has flipped over 100 homes and holds over 7 million in real estate assets. Okay, so did you all hear that? Over 7 million in, in real estate assets. That's amazing. Real estate wasn't his only career. John retired as a detective sergeant from the New Jersey State Police, having given 17 years of service. 
He walked away three years shy of vesting a pension for life to pursue his dream. Today, his KW profit share has surpassed his pension. I thought that was amazing to read. That's incredible, John. As the author of this book, John achieves another aspect of his dream, using his story to help others live a life by design. So now I've got the audience really intrigued. John, tell me what made you write this book? I always love to know what inspired you to write the book. You know, it's funny. I, I was talking to my wife and uh, I, I wanted to write a book years ago and I was thinking about it and um, she was like, well, what are you writing a book about? Like, what did you do? Kind of like, you know, which Typical I, spouse. You know my, my, my wife was real. You know, I'm like, yeah, you're kind of right. And this was, you know, this is before I, I really have really um, I was I, I was just about to kind of make the transition to Keller Williams. OK, Keller Williams for over 10 years now. Wow. Uh, so I was kind of in that position and, you know, I knew I was going to leave the state police. Yeah. I just didn't know when, because I had four children. I was scared like everyone, like I, you know, like, what do I do? I got this great job. I'm going to have a pension for life. All those things going on my head. Then I'm like, but I'm making a lot of money here in real estate. You know, like it's, it's starting to add up and accumulate where I'm like, I think I can do this. You know, I, I, think, yeah. I think I can do this. And, you know, with, a lot of great friends, a, a, a amazing wife, you know, and starting them to start to see that, you know, I wasn't happy because I, I think if I had to make another title, it was really, you know, being happy, you know, like that's the, yeah. title. I wasn't yeah. happy. I was, you know, I was a successful, unhappy entrepreneur. Yeah. And you can only do that. I don't care. I mean, anyone, yeah. almost, right. You know, like um, Tony Robbins said uh, on a podcast, that I was listening to, he said, I talked to, I'm, I'm, I coach a half a million, you know, people that make almost a billion dollars. They're not happy. Yeah. And that hit home too. Cause like, you know, all the, everyone's so striving to be rich. We should strive to be happy. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's, and, and I learned that probably 10 years ago, um, pro maybe a little bit longer because I was just burnt out, unhappy, had money in the bank, had nice cars, nice house, had a beautiful wife and kids, but I wasn't happy, which is crazy, right? You know, right. Like, how is that possible? Because you do, you had, you had on the outside, it looked like you had the, the perfect dream, right? You had beautiful family. It seemed like you were succeeding and yet you weren't happy. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, I think a lot of the unhappiness really was from me going to a job, right? Career, job, whatever you want to call it, that I felt like I, I didn't belong, you know, yeah. and every time I went, I felt more, you know, I would go to the shooting range and I'm like sick pits to pit in, you know, pit in my stomach, like, oh my God, like, and I should want to go shoot so I can shoot better. So, I, <laughs> you, know, I don't miss so you can you know? stay alive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I'm like dreading it. And, you know, I have to go to this in-service training and I'm like, well, you know, why am I going? And everyone's talking about retirement here. And, you know, it was just, a, it was a, it was actually a negative environment there, to be honest with you, because a lot of people were unhappy, didn't want to be there. They're, they're worried about you know, retiring at like 10 years on, like guys, you know, just got on like five years ago. He's like, I've retired in 15 years, three weeks and 10 months. I'm like, you, you just yeah. got here. It, you yeah. Going? Right. I mean, and, and that already tells you like, what kind of life is that? Right. If like everything in your, in your career is just based off of the day you retire, like, like how sad is that? Right. It, you're definitely not living your passion. And, and the fact that you walked away from a, from a pension three years before it was, it was coming up. Right. And that's $7,000 of income per month. I know because my mom's a retired principal. So I, she lives on her pension. Yeah. Right. Thank, thankfully. So she was a, a principal and it, good for her for having that. Um, but she doesn't have these other streams of income, like what you have built. And I love hearing that profit share itself has beat that, that, which is an, incredible, but I really want people to hear uh, the message, because a lot of, you know, why I started playing to win um, the series is that I found that 2020 was such a heavy year for so many of us. And here we are again, John, we were not expecting Delta, our, our friend Delta to come in and do what it's doing. And it's just, and then think about all the things happening in the world right now. Yeah. Our mindset is impacted by all of that. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of unhappiness. And when you said I wasn't happy, what else is, is more important than being healthy and being happy in life, right? There isn't anything. There well, isn't of, anything. Well, Melanie, think of all the things that it, it happens. So if you go to work, right, unhappy, you, you know, everyone around you sees it, you feel it, they feel it. Then you go home, 
your wife feels it, your kids feel it, right? Yeah. Your friends feel it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and just think of how lonely that life is, that, that, that journey going through everything. And when you think everyone thinks on the outside, it looks good, but then inside you're like, oh my God, like I, I dread going back to this place again, or I dread. That's whatever. right. So, right. Yeah, I mean, right. That, that was a journey I had for a long time, which yeah. just kind of led to well, a lot of the books. And I'm love that you share that. And so, so the playing to win, and, and I know, you know, this cause you're a KW guy and I'd heard it in bold or from Gary or somebody, right. It's like, instead of where, you know, so many people were playing not to lose. Mm-hmm. We had to play to win. And you like writing this book, sharing this, your story and you taking that leap of faith to take on the RD role. I, I loved getting to know more about your story through this book was playing to win, right? And, and, and people that are listening on this call, a lot of them are in situations where they're not happy. Um, I, and I, let me just say that I love that you call it dual career. I've been saying that for so many years. I said, guys, there's no such thing as part-time real estate agent because you can't part-time represent a client, right? You can't do that. You're all in, you're just doing multiple things, right? So there is no such thing. And, and all the new agents are like, oh, I like that. I'm like, yeah. Well, dual I, you know, I like dual career for people who treat it like a career, not a hobby. Yes, right. Because there are some people that treat the real estate as a hobby. So they, they can say, you know, yeah. career and hobby. Right. <laughs> I, I, I truly create, I treated it like a career. Right. You know, I, I made, you know, well over six figures, you know, I had, a, had other businesses off of it. So to me, that's a career. So I think the definition can be dual career if you actually treat it as such. Yeah. I lo- No, I totally agree. And it's amazing to see what the, that dual career that takes it seriously, what they can achieve is sometimes more success than the guy full time, right? Because the the seriousness they take it and that, yeah, I totally relate. I want to read something from your book here on the opening where it says it begins with family. Um, Keep having more guests pop up. That's great. It says you wrote instilling worthy character in a child is a challenge every parent understands who the youngest becomes the person he or she grows into is colored by their experiences from their first months of consciousness and awareness. Does it matter if a person starts with a little then turns it into a lot? Some would say no. I say yes, because that's me. I started with little. I've made it into a lot. My parents had limited education. My dad graduated the eighth grade. Mom received her high school diploma. There was no silver spoon upbringing in our family. We were working class. We fought every day to earn a living. Our family was provided for through bone breaking effort and stubborn commitment to a strong work ethic. I appreciate every bit of help that got me to where I am today as a human being, not just a businessman. I do not take all the credit for my success. Writing this book is possible because of my mom and dad's support over the years. I'm certain I would not be the man I am without my incredible wife by my side. And I don't know if it's Andrea or Andrea is special. Our remarkable children make our family complete. So when you think about where you are right now, that you made that leap of faith, like, how do you feel when you hear your words back to you right now about that? It begins with family, which is, I think is your most important thing. Yeah, that, that's chilling. Listen, you read it. I was like, man, that's, that sounds pretty good. Who wrote that? Um, <laughs> I know that guy I can connect and, you. <laughs> you know, uh, it's so true that, you know, I, I, I want to pinch myself every day and, and I really owe a lot to this company. I, I, I know it sounds cliche but I didn't have the mindset at my prior company. You know, this is my 23rd year in real estate. I just didn't have the mindset because it, you know, I was the top agent there. I was one of the top agents in the country when I, when I did come to KW as a dual career. Um, however, you know, the mindset was just, you know, I'm producer, you know, yeah. he's doing great. Just follow what he's doing. No, don't follow what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, don't follow. I'm burnt out, you know, right. I I didn't know how much money I was making. I was just making a lot. I didn't know, I wasn't tracking money. I wasn't around great leaders and mentors. And um, I didn't understand the path of money, which right. I just taught at Mega Camp, which I can't wait to air with uh, Mr. Leverett. Oh, I um, can't wait to watch that one. Yeah, you know, like all that stuff, I, I didn't know about it. You know, I, I wasn't learning based. You know, the, this is a great story. When I first came to KW and I was an area director at first, and my first event was a regional meeting. And, you know, listen, I was, you know, undercover narcotics working in the city. It wasn't like I was like, you know, um, upfront training, leading, any of that stuff. So all of a sudden I'm put it, 
I'm put on in front of like 150 people and I'm given a sheet with the agenda like right before of what I'm <laughs> saying and doing. Now, I'm not colorized, even though I was an OP, I was uncolorized because I was a dual career. Right. You know, and I was like, I went up there and I was like, bah, 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 bah. and I was like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I'm looking at the room. I, I couldn't wait to just get out of there. And, you know, the, I went home and I said, you know what? That'll never, ever happen again. And I went to Toastmasters. I was, I got more learning based. I, I listened to people who've done it before me. And I said, I, I, I want to feel confident in a room. I want to feel prepared. And, you know, just, just those examples of, of, of me learning through being in this company. And, and I think that's no matter if it's a leader or an agent, but there are systems out there, you know, that we've provide and it's there. It's yeah. just a matter of we're going to act on it, on those systems, right? Right, exactly. You know, or, or do we even know where to find them? Well, exactly. And what a growth opportunity for you, because here you were succeeding, you know, by just from your own, you know, E to P, right? Your entrepreneurial spirit got you pretty far. But then at some point you're like, I'm, if I don't change something, I'm going to max out, right? And burn out, right? And that's when I love them when you made, you know, the the move over. Um, I also want to, I want to read something else from your uh uh, book, if you don't mind, I've got a lot of little excerpts. Okay. Cause I, I, this is my, I love this. I get, I, I enjoy the second read almost more. Um, so where you said reality has meaning. Okay. Uh, are you working at a job or in a career that you don't love? Has this been your reality for years? Have you hated what you do? Do you year after year feel increasingly trapped in the wrong job? And I think right now with COVID and everything that's happened, I think a lot of people are asking this question more than ever because it's allowed them to, right? I was that person who did not love what I did. It took 17 years after I decided I wanted to leave before I took the leap. When I did, I walked away from a guaranteed government pension. Yes, you read that right. I left a state pension on the table, only three years shy of the vest of vesting and I tendered my resignation. Why did it take so long? Waiting for 17 years easily cost me millions. I knew as every year passed that I was giving up huge potential earnings. Why? It was fear. I was a cop. So you know that admitting to fear is not always easy. Fear. Worry about losing the false security of a job. Fear of the unknown. Doubt that I could make it happen even though I clearly saw the way forward. In this book, I share stories from my life. We will relive events that happened during my long journey from a small town, average student athlete to become a leader of leaders who owns multiple companies across three states. The stories that define who I am today show you the way to who you could be tomorrow. So are you doing what you want in life? If not, what's stopping you? We only get one life. Why not enjoy it? Let's make sure you live your life by design. You should not be stuck in a life where you wake up every morning dreading the day. It's journey time. We are doers. Let's go. Join me this time on the journey. I'll show you the way to your success. Let's go. I love it. That's, that's your thing, isn't it? Let's go. I, I, I saw like you post that. Better, yeah. Do you, that's your thing. Like, let's go. Yeah. I just can't wait in, in the chat. Let's go. They get the, your people know you, right? When you think about though, um, you know, I, lo I love that like no one's life is guaranteed. No one's time is guaranteed. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that later because I loved your story at the end about the seconds. And we'll talk about that. We're going to end with that. OK, yep. um, but but let's talk about that. So you're investing, you get into investing, you know, you're helping other, you know, you get this great gig as you know, it, with New Jersey and, and you're like, this is the way this is the way it was super competitive to get in there. You got accepted. You're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. And then you did that for a long, long time. But then I love the story of your, your head, like a, it, it's something, you know, something's going down in one of the neighborhoods and you like, oh, that house, <laughs> you're like thinking properties, right? While you're right. doing it. Yeah. So, so tell me, how did, like, how did that evolve for you? And how did you discover that you were good at that? Like, I think, cause I think investing, I think a lot of people, whether they ever quit their job think about the wealth building they can do in investing, even if they never get into real estate on our, on what we do. Right. Um, even if like, I, I used to go to the kids schools, John, and I would talk every year, my kids were in middle school and talk to kids about thinking bigger and creating a life by design. So mm -hmm. I love this. And I was like, and, and either, even if you don't come with work with us at Keller Williams, you should be thinking about real estate. Yeah. So how did you take that very little? And let's talk about that journey in a little bit. Like, how did you 
find the time to create that into your world while you had a really stressful, high pressure job that you were in? You know, there's a thing called shift work, um, you know, and a lot of people do it, nurses and, and police officers and firefighters. And there is downtime, you know, there in our lives. And, you know, uh, at the time I had younger children, you know, like obviously early on, no children, but as, you know, as it progressed and my time was, you know, I had a, I had some decent amount of time. Right. And yeah. you know, what you do with your free time is part of wealth building, right. You know, what you save is part of wealth building. So for me, I chose instead of going out and doing things and hanging out, I chose to really start a hobby called investing. And, you know, I didn't have any money. So I asked dad for half the money and got half. And we bought a little uh, section eight rental, uh, uh, five Lehi Lehigh court, which I won't wow. forget. And that led to, you know, a whole bunch of homes. I still own a, a bunch of uh, rentals and, and commercial buildings. And, you know, eventually I started selling, selling them off, buying nicer things, you know, um, selling off some of the ones that had the horrible tenants and <laughs> right. keeping the good tenants and getting rid of the bad ones. And, right. and, 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 you know, I was during the boom where, you know, before capital gains hit, you know, it was 12 months at one point, you, you keep it for 12 and you don't get hit with capital gains. So I was living in a house, a new construction, flipped it a couple hundred thousand, you know, did it again. So nice. I was playing all kinds of games. And then I, met this beautiful lady called Andrea and, you know, I couldn't be, I couldn't flip those houses anymore like that. Cause you know, had, had, <laughs> not the I living in it part. Right. right? <laughs> and then you start out. Yeah, she probably struggling. didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff. So, you know, I, I think it, it, it worked out right in terms of the evolution of my life where I, you know, when it was time to settle down, it was the right time. And then, you know, but I still wasn't smart, meaning I was making a lot of money, but wasn't keeping a lot of money as I find out when I started to, you know, write down every day what I, what I spend and how much yeah. it costs for a lifestyle, which, you know, you learn in MREI. Right. Um, that I would say if, if I could tell anyone anything, and I, I say it every time I talk to people about my book, but if you could track your expenses for 30 days, the ahas you get from that exercise alone, and, and, and don't act like you're on a diet when you do it. Like a lot of people, like they watch what they're doing when they're on a diet. <laughs> and they're be extra careful. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't watch it. Be like you are, you know, go to dinner, go to the events, do everything, you know, go to the pharmacy and spend $300, do all that stuff. And then look at that and then tell me, you know, do you make enough money? Tell me, are you really in a good position for your family or not? And that exercise really made, you know, made me think like, I got to be smarter, you know, I got to do things better. And, and I think, you know, that journey with the state police was necessary because the discipline and the things that I've learned, but also what got me away from it was the mindset in that, in that room or in those rooms I was in was definitely um, very employee-based, right? If you know the yeah. quadrant employee, right? The, the self-employed yep. business owner, investor. And yeah. I started to really like the, the right side of the quadrant. <laughs> That, that business and investor side. Yes. And I kept playing in that left side because that's where a lot of my, you know, 40, 50 hours a week was spent there. And I didn't want to be over there anymore. And I think that was the conflict in my life was I was living in this way and I wanted to be over here. My mindset was there. My, everything about me was there. And then the, in, in the book, I tell the story was I was at a little, uh, we had like a, a shift dinner or whatever. And, the, and earlier that day, I had a bunch of settlements and I had a bunch of checks. You know, I was, I'm old school. Like, you know, I, yeah. not now because I've got too many kids, but, <laughs> you know, I used to always have like a knot of like hundreds, you know, because it's just, you yeah, know, you yeah. that didn't happen you, with the kids. All those yeah, girls yeah. need yeah. stuff. <laughs> you think you got a lot of money. You got the couple thousand dollars and you're not all wrapped up in the rubber band and all that. Um, no, no more. But I also, yeah, although uh, I never did that, John, that was, the, maybe that's, that's a, a guy, guy thing. thing. <laughs> I think. That's a guy thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the other thing was uh, when I had checks for settlements, you know, I, I had a bunch of settlements and I, I flipped the house that day and I had like a hundred and some thousand dollars of checks in my pocket. Amazing. I right to work. Amazing. And, you know, I went there and every time I go to work, everyone's just breaking my stones about <laughs> real estate. Oh, uh, you know, you're a real estate guy. You're not, you're wasting time with those tenants and landlord. And I was like, I just kept yeah. hearing it. And I was like, don't do it, John. Do it, John. Don't do it, John. Yeah, I did it. I was like, does this look like wasting time? And then I, that was kind of the end of me having a, you know, a, 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 an easier time in the state police, because I think then 
Everyone was watching. Supervisors are like, or is he, is he, where's he at? If he's not here, is he at his property? Right. And, and that call, and that my advice to those fit people in my position, don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Exactly. Here, learn from me. <laughs> um, but, but it, it did help me know that, you know, I can make a hundred thousand dollars in a day, which wow. is probably at the time what I made a year in that year. Yeah. So eventually, you know, the mindset says, listen, if I can do this, just imagine if I'm not minus 40 hours a week, what could I, what could happen, you know, and how much time can I spend with my family? How much yeah. time can I spend on my business? How much time can I spend for me? Right. Right. Own sanity. Yeah. And, and let's, and not to even mention John, like not be risking your life every day. There's that too, right, dear? I mean, there is that part of it, right? And then you think about the cost, like what's the value of your life? And 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 you do, by the way, if you've not seen John's family, you have a beautiful family and you must be so proud of that. My wife um, makes, makes us look really good. She, she, you know what, you, you, <laughs> y'all do a great job. You're a very, very beautiful couple. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump into uh, on page, what page is this? Just in case everybody, anybody has a book or looks at it later, page 27. Uh, and you say it doesn't matter, you use the quote, it doesn't matter where you start, it matters where you finish. And you talk about this and it says, this was something my father said to me often. I don't know if he knew it as a quote from T.D. Jakes, but he knew it as a reality of life. It was a lesson he wanted me to embrace. Unfortunately, in his younger years, my dad became a convicted felon. A positive part of this experience was he was in prison with the famous Reuben Hurricane Carter. Will Smith played Carter when they made a movie about his life. My dad fought Hurricane in prison. It was an organized boxing match in the Trenton State Penitentiary. I don't remember my dad ever saying who won the fight. I say Cal Jada or one uh, was that his dad's boxing. It was your dad's boxing name, right? <clears throat> my dad was an aspiring boxer prior to getting into trouble in the mid sixties. Then he was an incredible citizen, loving family man <clears throat> and successful businessman for five decades after serving his time. I'm proud of him and what he accomplished, especially considering where he began. And so I love how you talk about, it doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you finish. Mm hmm yeah. Yeah. If you think about that, you know, uh, especially with the social equity and all the stuff going on in this world, you know, some people really don't, um, they don't, it, I want to say, I don't want to say a fair chance, but some people really don't know where to go or the direction and don't have a lot of yeah. people supporting them. Right. And, and my dad <laughs> definitely was one of them. Mm. And, you know, without education, it was really hard. Right. So he had to use hard work kind of as his thing. And, and it took him a lot of years to get where, where he was. Cause you know, we grew up, you know, not definitely not in a good place, but as the years went and his personality, meaning people seen how much he gave to his customers and, you know, he was, he did what he said he was going to do. And he, and he always showed up and he took clients, you know, that, you know, just like realtors, right. Take the $10,000 listing and take the million dollar listing, right. Don't, right. don't discriminate because right. of, of whatever. And, you know, that's kind of how I behaved as a realtor, as a business owner. And, you know, a little different, you know, a little bit as you kind of climb the ladder, you just time is like Gary says, you know, I'm no different than you. It's just my long, my line's longer. And, <laughs> right. And, and I think for me, you know, my, you know, being a division leader and all these other things, I mean, my line is long, but yeah. you know, listen, like anything in life, if it's important to you, you'll, you'll figure it out. Right. Right. And, you know, I, I do try to figure out how I can help people not so fortunate, um, because, you know, there was a point where I needed that and I had to kind of figure a lot of things out on my own where maybe I can share uh, with someone, you know, about budgeting, about just getting your license, right? Getting a real estate license, the barrier of entry is not that hard. It's and not. With, with, with some simple tips, right? Which you can create from that is, I, I think it's limitless. Right. It, exactly. But I really, really loved that story about your dad because, uh, I, and how you applied it to it's, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Because I think a lot of people will think, um, there's a lot of judgment in people in, on, on themselves too. Yes. On others as well. But it's like you, if you don't like your life, what I think the message out of this is if you don't like where you're at, you could like so many things, but it's your job or a relationship or whatever it is. Like, find your happy. Like you said, your name of the book could really be find your happy, like figure that out. Cause guys, you have a choice. And I, John, I make the joke, you know, Klaus, my husband's German. We met on a, on a movie set in Germany 25 years ago. We've been married 24 years. Our kids are grown and he's in a filming right now in Southern Germany. And, and I, um, <laughs> during our anniversary, I said, 
you know, I'm, you know, you know, I'm married to you because I want to be. And he goes, what do you mean by that? And I said, it's, it's a choice. I said, every day you have a choice to be married to me. And every day I have a choice to be married to you. So choosing to be together is really choosing each other. And he's like, he was like, he didn't understand that. And I said, because you know what, everything we do in life is a choice. And so I said, I don't know how I could compliment you any greater than that. You know, I'm choosing to be your wife. I'm choosing to be married to you. I'm choosing to be, you know, in the fact that you're choosing to send your time, John, with us today is, a, is an honor to all of us. But you know what I mean? So I got, I think your book really like that with your story of your dad, he made a choice. He could have either gone victim mode of whatever with the system or this or that. And he didn't. He went a different way. Same with you. You could have held on three more years. And guess what? During that three years, something terrible could have happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you reminded me something and you said it twice, you know, uh, in in reading the book, you know, my dad actually hired a lot of uh, people out of prison. And, you know, the thing I don't think he knew, my my dad passed a few years ago, but I, I don't think he knew like how bad these people are meeting that stuff they <laughs> right. taught me. Uh, and, you know, like, you know, like they're bringing the drinks on the job. I mean, I could, tell oh, all, I could tell all kinds of stories about that. Right. Um, but what I did learn from those guys were they actually were decent human beings yeah. um, deep down inside. Like some, they've done bad things. Trust me, I, there's, I could go over all that stuff. But what I did, they, they respected my dad. They treated me with respect and they, you know, they couldn't get a job, right? They, they, no one was hiring them. Right. And that's and that's still a problem today. These people got. Oh, yeah. And they go right back because there's just nowhere. To, where are they going? You know, it's a so broken he, system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He hired those folks and I give him a lot of credit. And and a few of them really got got out of I mean, some got back in and got killed and all kinds of stuff. But right. But a few did get through, which which I'm proud of him for doing that. And he always gave them time and, and he did. And he gave them money probably when he shouldn't have and yeah. you know, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, that you know, that kind of stuff, you know, we, we're doing that now. I know you do it as a business owner and stuff. Sometimes yep. you got to help other people along the way and you can't forget where you came from. Amen to that, right? Amen to that. And, and it's moving from success to significance, right? When you really can be that person that lifts a hand to somebody else and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet on you. I'm yeah. going to bet on you, right? You may not even bet on yourself right now, but I'm going to bet on you and yeah. what that does for people, right? And they stand up straighter. And, and so, so I love the, the concept around it's how you finish. It's not how you start. Okay. I'm going to talk about 9-11 a little bit with you because I, that really moved me on uh, page um, 79. And you said September 11th, um, the day the world would change forever the deadliest days of our American history when we were attacked by terrorists. And meanwhile, you're still, you know, working full-time as a state trooper, right? Uh, no. Law enforcement is the kind of career you get paid for uh, what you might have to do. Not always what you do. 9-11 was one of those situations. I think every American can recall where they were when the tax occurred. I was at the Deerfield Municipal Court for a court appearance and when we heard the news, it was an eerie feeling, sh feeling shared among the entire courtroom. There was a moment of bonding between criminals, prosecutors, judicial staff, troopers, and other courtroom participants. I, know, I knew I could get a call of do uh, to duty at any moment, especially since at that moment, I was considered non-essential personnel. I was not on the road. I was at that time assigned to the alcoholic beverage control unit. As expected, I got the call a few years later, or sorry, hours later from my supervisor. I was to support, uh, report and get geared up. An assignment would be given out. I should be prepared to stay a few nights. I'd be working 12 hour plus shifts with mandatory overtime. Uh, and then I would skip down to here. Um, during this time, we were unsure if the attacks would continue. I remember not sleeping for days. We were always on alert, especially while working the details. There were many questions and no answers. During those early hours and days after the attack, we were uncertain about what was gonna happen or when. This was a time where I felt proud to be able to do something of value in support of the horrific event. It was a time when Americans honored what we do as police officers. I felt exceptionally proud to be a New Jersey state trooper defending our state and our country. When I was not assigned to the uh, Newark airport partnering with National Guard, I would have a patrol detail touring around the Cavan Point tunnels and bridges. Can you imagine New York City on a Saturday night with not one car on the road other than my patrol car? That was one of the eeriest times I remember as an officer my entire career. I remember driving down to the tower site where they were looking for people, digging through the massive rubble, hoping against hope to pull out even one survivor. 
It was quiet, no radio, no city sounds, nothing. I thought about how lucky I was to be alive. I thought about how sad I felt for those who didn't make it and their mourning um, families. And that could have easily been me. Was that a turning point at all for you? No, I was, I was what, two or three years in as a state trooper then. Um, okay, was, so you're early on. on okay. Six, you know, so it was 2001, like four or five years in. I think at that point, um, you know, it, you brought me back a lot. But when, when thinking about that, that day when I got the call, just think, you know, I'm driving towards it. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, who knows if there's still planes. I don't know about you. You look up for planes now and like you're looking right. up the whole time. And we're not sure we're, you know, we're going into the hot zone because Newark was one of the places where the plane, you know, went out of. Yeah. So going there, it was definitely, it was, it was odd. And, you know, I knew I had to go, right. You know, you, you got, you got, you got, you know, you got a job to do. And I went there thinking I'd be there for three. We stayed there for at least for me, I was there for seven straight days and they put us up in the hotel at the airport. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, we're, we're working, you know, 12, 18 hour shifts. Uh, because the the port authority was decimated um so we you know and I, I i tell this this is a leadership lesson i think i do recall like so we partnered with national guard um and in the airport it was state police and national guard and then we would have some sort of supervisor for that i was on the night shift and i remember like the supervisor that was confident and really gave us clarity and direction like you felt good like you know he made sure you got breaks made sure you wasn't standing at a post too long, like all that's, you know, all that stuff matters, right? You sit, just imagine standing for, you know, and you don't want to sit down because you, you're not sure who's coming through those, you know, those checkpoints. And we're not sure right. if still like, you know, this is like, this is like day, you know, the day one, two, three days after. Wow. You know, you're on high alert. And, you know, I just remember like feeling good when some leaders took control and told us, hey, this is what we're doing. We got this and we're, we're ready to rock and roll. Here's, here's, a, here's your, your, your list. We you know took some breaks here and there, but we all knew what to do and we felt confident in what we're doing. And then you get the supervisors that are lazy, kind of not sure of themselves. And you're like, oh my God, like I'm like, I feel a little nervous. Like, you know, like this is who's leading us. And you know, so leadership now I think is is so needed more than ever of just giving your people clarity. Yes, you might feel scared inside, but you gotta just you know, you're a leader, you got to suck it up and, you know, yeah. cry right before the meeting and then come in and deliver what you need to do. So Game face. Right, right? right. Exactly. Uh, but that, you know, but that, that lesson is, you know, like how important it is to, to, as a leader, because your people are looking at you for direction. And when you look nervous, <laughs> they're going to be nervous, right? <laughs> That's right. That's so, right. Uh, yeah, well, that, how that do you, how, how is this uh, transferred for you? Because you're, you, like you mentioned, you're a di- divisional leader too. And if people don't know that, that means you oversee multiple uh, regions. And so when you, when you think about what we've been through and leading people in this time in our life, I think is also really interesting, right? Um, through a pandemic, because again, the pandemic hit everybody. There's not one person that COVID does not impact, right? This impacts everybody. Very different from like the economic downturn when I got in the market in 2006, where it really affected homeowners, right? Um, And it created opportunity for first-time homebuyers, right? But today, what we deal with as leaders is very different. And I don't think, I don't know what it is, is even anywhere near that, right? Um, So so do you feel like a lot of these leadership lessons that you had all through your other career has served you well? Because you, it seems like you, you just are such a natural leader in this I know you say you have you have had to learn a lot with speaking and stuff like that, but it seems like these life lessons show up in you in your life every day now. Yeah, my wife says, you know, I'm not built like you because, like, you know, I'll keep going and going, and like, you know, we're we're moving and all kinds of stuff going on and COVID and the kids in school, out of school, and right, you know, you know health and all that stuff. So, you know, for me, it's just you know another day, just go. But I, I think as a leader, you gotta um, you, you gotta know your people and you gotta. Uh, you you got to care about them, right? I think care and candor is, 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 is important. And, you know, um, the great Mike Brody, uh, I had him on a divisional call and he told us a story about cattle and bison. And he was just saying how, you know, in a storm, right? If you're in Colorado, just imagine, you know, the cattle run away from the storm, right? And the storm's coming towards them now. So they're running, trying to get away from it, but they're not that fast. And the storm catches up and they get the whole brunt of the storm where the bison go right at the storm and then they're only going to have it a little bit and they get out of the clear and they're good. 
And I think, you know, we all have to be bisons, you know, especially yeah. leaders. Now we, we gotta, you know, we're going to have a little bit of storm, right. You know, we're, you know, yeah. we could get sick. We might have people that, 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 you know, that might not even make it through this, which is, which is horrible, but yeah. you know, we, we gotta, we, it is what it is, right. This is the new normal and it could be an endemic as Gary put it, that yeah. might, you know, probably will be here forever. Right. And, 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 you know, what's interesting, I think, I think our job as, as leading others is also leading them how they need to be in their life. Right. And so that's because our agents are leaders to their clients, right? They are leading them in the biggest financial decisions these people are making in their lifetime. So they're looking to the agent to lead them and the agent to be that calm in the storm. Right. So we're all really in this together, which I, I love how, why I brought up the nine 11 thing is I, I loved uh, the idea of you in the courtroom and how everybody, my dad's a retired attorney, by the way. And so uh, I used to love going and watch him in court, you know, and, uh, but everybody being in that moment, we were all one. Oh, yeah. Like everybody forgot the label, everybody, right? We forgot the and, guy was with the handcuffs on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? You're, you're hugging him too, right? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a beautiful, that's the beautiful yeah. moment of all of that, right? And I think that, that the, the pandemic, what we should, <clears throat> I don't mean to say should, but hopefully if we do this the right way, this all brings us together, right? That we, we are all in this together and together we get through this together, we find the solutions. And so I love that, that um, piece of it. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to one page 163 because I love this one. And then uh, I'll ask you a few more questions, but it says, imagine you had a bank account that deposited $86,400 each morning. The account carries over no balance from day to day allows you to keep no cash balance and every evening removes whatever part of that amount you failed to use during the day. What would you do? Draw it every dollar each day, of course, right? Uh, we all have such a bank. Its name is time. Every morning, it credits you with 86,400 seconds. Every night, it writes it off as lost, whatever time you have failed to use wisely. There's never any borrowing time. You can't take a loan out on your time or against someone else's. The time you have is the time you have. That's it. Time management is yours to decide how you spend the time. Your money works the same. You decide how to spend your money. Don't be satisfied with the success stories of others. Write your own, unfold your tale and bring it to life. You have everything you need to become what you can become. You know, this is a great story. Um, my son's in flag football. So yesterday I had calls from the minute I was driving him, literally till he was done. So he was there from four to 5.30. And he was unprepared. He was hot, it was 94 degrees. <laughs> Dad didn't give him ice in his thing, right? He just had a water bottle that was hot. Right. Um, he felt nervous and wasn't prepared. And I could have probably shifted some calls around, but I didn't. Right. So the next day, that was Monday. So Tuesday, yesterday, I, I made sure that half an hour before I was good and that I could talk to him on the ride. He had ice. He had a towel, cold towel. He felt confident. I gave him a pep talk and everything. So when you think about that, like, you know, you got to time is precious, you know, and that little bit changed his whole day. And he had a, great, a better practice. He felt good about himself as opposed to the day before. All right. And what a difference in the outcome of that day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that by, take, by you taking that time to help him be prepared, set him up for success, give him the gift of your time, which is the best thing you can do as a dad, right? Is giving kids your, I understand this, you know, mom, put the phone down. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I live that you life do that in business. You, you blow these people off that really, and again, some, yeah. some don't, they need to do it themselves, but some really need your help. And yeah. what you do with that time, you know, you could blow them off or you could take 10 minutes and really give them the right direction. You might not do it for them, but you're going to give them the right direction. And, and listen, the, the child, the, the, the family things on us, right. I, I have to do better than that. But, yeah. you know, I think it's in every facet of life. We have to think about time and what we're doing at that time. Right. Yeah. It just gave me chills reading that because because it's true and and I think the other thing that I that I got from that passage that was so hitting home for me and and for so many I think that will read that is you know uh, quit putting off what you want to do like don't don't think you have all this time like that's why I love that you walked in there 
three years before you're going to have this pension, right? And you're like, no, I'm done. My time, that, that's, that's 86,400 seconds per day that I don't want to give up to that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. And I just applaud you and admire so, you so much for that because so many people would not have done that. And, and think of all of that energy and time that you just put into such a big life that you've created for yourself and your family and in a happier place. Yeah. They didn't even know what to do with me when I, when I, when I told them I was leaving, they were like, what do you mean? They didn't know what to do with my gun. They didn't know what to do with my pension. Like what happens to it? Like, does he lose it all? Um, Like there were so many unanswered questions. They didn't give me my badge, which really hurt my heart that I didn't even get to retire. I've been shot at, I stat, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I didn't even get a retirement badge. I got it three years later. Thank God. That some okay, good, good. People, good. I was uh, going to ask. <laughs> good people that uh, my classmates that became high ranking people fought for me because they knew I, you know, I, I did my, I did my time I mean, 17 years. It's a Listen, long time. And this is the truth. And I, you know, I, people might get upset, but I know a lot of people that left, said they were hurt, left the job and got the, the benefits and the pension. Listen, I could have did that, but I don't go, I don't do that. That's not me. I, it's not I, who you are. It was time for me to leave and yeah. I wasn't hurt. Uh, yeah. I didn't have any issues. I just, it was time to us. It's time to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But life, life will reward you for that though, my dear way more for that, right. For how you show up in life. I, I really, I really believe that, you know, you teach people how to treat you, treat, you know, what you, you get, what you deserve in your imagination, like all of those bold laws. Um, exactly. Yeah. But I, I love that. And so, so really, so tell me in your opinion, in these last couple minutes we have. Um, so I always ask this question and I know we spent a lot of time in the book, which I re- thank you for going over that with me. Um, what is playing to win look like for you? I always love asking that question to my guests. Yeah. You know, I, I go back to the word happiness and playing to win for me is, you know, uh, number one, am I happy? Right. Cause I can't help my wife, my kids, my, my businesses, Keller Williams regions, all that stuff. If I'm not happy. Right. So yeah. um, I got to check myself every day. You know, am I happy? Am I healthy? Am I getting sleep? Am I eating? You know, all that stuff, uh, especially in a pandemic. Right. I mean, I, yeah. I, I was telling people when uh, this first happened, everyone's like, you know, they're on there like I'm working out I'm getting up. Really, I, I went the opposite way. Like I was watching Netflix. I was <laughs> not working out like because I've done it for so long. I kind of got in this bad ritual for like three weeks, me and my wife. And I'm like, I got to stop this. You know, then, because, you know, you weren't going to the gym, you know, you're scared to do all that. And right. then I started, you know, like you know, I, my, I have bad knees. So I started uh, walking and doing push ups and and do, I, everyone bought a Peloton and all that stuff. I did all that stuff. And, yeah. And, and, you know, little I got back to my reading and my podcast and stuff. But I, you know, I fell into a little trap. So, you know, I told me, listen, it happens, you know, and, and and you might do it again. You know, you might fall into another little trap because this is different for us all. And and you got to give people space. So, you know, for me being happy and then, you know, obviously I have a wife and kids that I'm responsible for. So making sure that they're good, you know, like you do well-being checks on your agents, you, you need to do it with your family, right? Are you good, yeah. honey, kids, are you guys good? And then yeah. I go right down the line of my, my, my business partners, my, my agents, as much as I can touch, I try to um, making sure that we're all good. And sometimes it's getting out of business with people too, you know, part of part of winning is me making sure I'm, I'm, I got the right people by my side. Um, and that goes for, you know, friends, family, right. all that stuff. So winning to me is just being surrounded by uh, happy people, including myself and, and that they're winning too, because um, it's all good for me winning, but if I'm, I'm the only one winning um, that that's not a good feeling. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. I need to make sure I bring some people on the ride with me. I love that. I love that. And and with investing, are you still really doing a lot of your investments or are they just kind of handling themselves for now? Cause you've, you have so many of them. Are you still focused? Is that still so I, an arm of what you do right now? I, I did a thing. I, I, my wife and I, we, we left, well, I still have my house down the Jersey shore in New Jersey, but I bought a house in Boca Raton, Florida, um, which is almost done in about 30 days. Nice. So, so I kind of been busy uh, with a lot of that stuff and transition. Um, I haven't done a lot of investing, but I am buying the building that my real estate company, a 25,000 square foot building we're buying now. Um, oh, excellent. That's great. So I am doing that. And, uh, you know, uh, I see a couple of my team members on here. I mean, I've been telling them to find some properties and I'll, I'll, you know, put the money up and let's go. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you know, I do want to invest. I'm just trying to get some good, 
portfolios to invest in. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah I'm, I still have to I have a property manager and all that stuff handling my stuff, but um, I haven't been as active. I've been really trying to get the family part going the last six or seven well, months. Well, and that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. Are you guys seeing the same crazy market in all of your regions as we see in Austin? Like, has it been just it's, crazy? It's, it's awesomely good. Yes. And honestly, I'm in this Florida market. This is insane. Is it? This market is like a year later. I mean, there, there's people with a million dollars of equity. Uh, I mean, wow. it's, it's, it's wow. insane. Uh, this, wow. I, mean, I heard Austin's pretty insane too. So It is. It is. You know, I mean, I think what we're seeing here now and every week's different. So we always bring it up a little bit, but, you know, we were seeing 100, 200, 300,000 over ask price. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. now, now that's kind of less, right. You're, you're still getting multiple offers depending on the area, but you're not seeing this crazy. It's like, it's like everybody kind of like took a breather and we're seeing more listing inventory coming on the market. So it's, it's, you know, that could be before school, you know, we're, we're watching all those, you know, one month does not make a trend, but we're definitely feeling less activity um, and more opportunity for buyers now because buyers were getting really burnt out on multiple offers and stuff like that. So yeah, we're seeing... I think that's a trend that's going through, through the country a little, but I think it's starting yeah. Not so yeah. insane, right? Uh, but um, you know, it's still good. Oh no, it's great! It's great, and there's is always, especially with the interest rates being so low, is such a great time to buy real estate. It's always a great um, time to uh, you know invest. Now, I want to just for the last couple of minutes, does anybody have a question that I didn't ask or that you'd like to know about? Uh, whether on, and I'll check on the live stream here, or, but any of our audience here, would you like to ask anything to their fabulous guests today? And I, the let's go. Every time I hear let's go, I'm going to be thinking, you know, yeah, John. You're like, let's go. Like there should be no <laughs> silence. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Who, what you got? And looking on here, find your happy. Okay. That was one of my agents. He says, find your happy. Love that. Anybody have a question too shy? Everybody shy? Or do you have one for us? Like we're not shy. <laughs> We just know everything about him. <laughs> you got some of your team members. Anybody else have a question? I'm going to open it up. Last chance. Yeah, I'm not shy, but John hears from me enough. Oh, I would love, I'd love to hear. I would love, you're the best person to ask him a question because it might be some, I don't know. There's a Clyde group leaders right there. I love that. That's amazing. I love to see your team members on here. Y'all look like you're doing an amazing job together. Uh, so what's the, what's the team doing this year? What's the goal of the team? Just the real estate team. Team, what, what, what's the goal? 188. Yeah. yeah. Are you shy? 188. Yeah. <laughs> She's like 188. <laughs> 188 homes sold. Yeah, oh, that's a wonderful. That is amazing. That's great. And on track, are we on track for that? Team. Almost. Okay. Almost. But we're almost on track with a plan to execute. Okay, perfect. Getting into action. Let's go, right? Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, we definitely, <laughs> we, we definitely need to let's go there. Let's there go. we go. Well, maybe maybe this will motivate them uh, to to get into action because now they just put it on live. Uh, you know, a lot of people are going to see that your team wants to do 188 transactions. So there you go. Well, I'm excited to know uh, that you have a session at uh, Mega Camp. I can't wait to see you on that. And and John, just thank you for all that you do in the world. Uh, we love having you as a leader at Keller Williams, and I just admire you from afar. And now reading your story, I just admire you even more. And so thank you for the gift of your time today. Thank you so much. I had so much fun. You, you did a great job. Thank you. Well, we'll have you back for something else. We'll talk about wealth building or something. I love, I'll, I'll <laughs> always talk about wealth building. Okay. I love it. Well, John, thanks for all you do. And for those of you thinking about, you know, they're not happy where they're at, read this book, Leaving Six Figures by John Clyde. Uh, highly recommend um, and start thinking about the life you really want to live because that's playing to win. Don't play not to lose. Right. So thanks for watching guys. Thanks, John. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Take care, right. everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you.